Hello to you. I do hope you're well. Welcome to this GCSE Religious Studies Revision Session. I'm Ben Wardle and today we are covering everything you need to know for the Islamic Practices section of AQA Paper 1. So this video is going to talk you through the key words, the key concepts, the key quotes and also the key evaluation points. Because remember, 50% of your marks in GCSE RE come from your evaluation. So we won't just be asking uh, what are the different practices, but we'll also be evaluating them. For example, we'll be asking, is one practice more important than the others? So plenty to talk about today. We're going to cover everything you need to get 24 out of 24 on this section of the exam to secure that grade nine. So make sure that you've got a drink, make sure you've got some snacks, get your post-it notes ready, get a pen and paper to hand. And yes, let's talk through all the key Islamic practices we need to know. Now, on the screen for you here, I've got the AQA specification. So this sets out the eight topics that we need to know for the Islamic practices section. And remember, guys, sorry, just putting my green tea down there. Um, we are going to have five questions on Islamic practices on the exam. We've got our one marker, our two marker, our four marker, five marker, and then, of course, our 12 marker. So we could be asked, as I say, about any of these eight topics. And we will be talking through each of them in today's video. So we're going to start by just having an overview of the five pillars of Sunni Islam and the 10 obligatory acts in Shia Islam. And we'll be asking why are they important? Why have they been chosen? And what is the purpose of having these five pillars and these 10 obligatory acts? And then we're going to zoom in. We're going to take a closer look at the following ones, at these seven. So we're going to be looking at Shahada, the Declaration of Faith, of course, and we'll be looking at its place in Muslim practice. We'll then be looking at Salah. So we'll be asking what is the significance of prayer? How and why do Muslims pray? We'll be looking at where Muslims pray. Is it more important to pray at home or in the mosque, for example? Uh, we'll be looking at Friday prayers and what happens. And we'll be looking at key differences between uh, Sunni and Shia Islamic beliefs about prayer. We'll then be looking at Psalms. So we'll be looking at the role and significance of fasting during the month of Ramadan, including the origins of this practice, the how did it develop. We'll be looking at the duties that involves, you know, you're not just abstaining from food and drink during daylight hours, but you're also focusing on the mind as well. And um, we'll be looking at the benefits of fasting, so why it's important for Muslims any exceptions or exemptions from fasting and the reasons for them. Uh, we'll then look at zakat or zakat, uh, the role and significance of giving alms, including the origins of this practice, how and why zakat is given. We'll be looking at who receives the benefits of it. And we'll also be looking at kums in Shia Islam as well. So we'll be asking what is the difference between zakat and kums. We'll be looking at hajj, so the role and significance of pilgrimage to Mecca, including, again, the origins of this, how it's actually performed, the actions that are performed. And we'll be looking at their importance and significance. So again, you know, we won't just be saying, well, what is Hajj? We'll be asking, why is it important? And we'll be asking, is this the most important pillar? Is this the most important practice? We'll then be looking at Jihad or Jihad, excuse my pronunciation there, uh, different understandings of it. So we'll be looking at the lesser and greater Jihad, for example, the meaning and significance of each of them. Uh, and again, that will give us a nice link, actually, to theme D uh, when we talk about uh, peace and conflict. And we're talking about this idea of holy war. Um, and we will finally look today at festivals and commemorations and their importance for Muslims in Great Britain today. And we'll be looking in particular at uh, Id al Adha. Eid al Fitr and Ashura. Now, please do, can I just say, excuse my pronunciations today. I do apologize for the Cheshire accent. Um, but remember, in the exam, you do just need to make sure your spellings are correct. Um, so yeah, apologies again if I do get any of the pronunciations wrong. Um, but let me just share with you a brilliant um, piece of scripture. So a brilliant quote from Surah 2. We mentioned this as well when we spoke about the beliefs and teachings. And remember, everything we spoke about in the beliefs and teachings video is still relevant because the practices, the Islamic practices, are all about putting those beliefs and teachings into practice, aren't they? So, you know, always be drawing upon your knowledge of the beliefs and teaching section when you're writing about practices. Um, but Surah 2, I think, is brilliant because it does encapsulate a couple of these key practices. 
So Surati says the truly good, so those people who are good, and so these are the people that will be rewarded with life after death. Um, so the truly good are those who believe in God and the last day, in the angels, the scripture and the prophets. So of course that talks about the beliefs and teachings. But then it is also those who keep up the prayer and pay the prescribed alms. So we'll be looking at how important practices are for Muslims. And that is the key word, this idea of the importance. What is the significance? What is the reason for them? Because remember, Islam is not just a religion that people believe in, but it has a massive impact on how they live their lives, on the practices that they perform in their everyday lives. And so that is what we're looking at today. But yes, remember, with all of these practices, we're going to be linking them back to the Quran, for example, because that is where we get the scriptural foundation for these practices. So really important that we are referring to scripture and you will see scripture in these blue boxes throughout the video. So yeah, have a look out for that. So let's get started, shall we, with the five pillars of Sunni Islam. And the five pillars are Shahada, which is the declaration of faith, Salah, which is obligatory prayer. And for Sunni Muslims, it is five times a day. Shia Muslims may combine that into three times a day. Zakat or Zakah, which is compulsory giving. Psalm, which is fasting during Ramadan. And Hajj, which is pilgrimage to Mecca. Now, we've got to ask, what are these five pillars and why are they important? Why do they exist? So we need to know that they are called the five pillars because they form the foundation of Muslim life. If you think about it, a pillar is something that holds something up. And so these pillars hold up the religion, if you like. They provide the foundation for the religion. And that is why they are so important, because they are seen as the things that you do if you are a Muslim. So they really form the foundation of living a Muslim life, of putting the beliefs and teachings of this religion into practice. They provide a framework for Muslims. They are the beliefs and actions that unite Sunni Muslims. They give this really clear understanding of what being a Sunni Muslim involves, don't they? Because it outlines for you these five essential things that you need to be doing, that you need to be practicing. They give structure to daily life. You know, for example, Salah, five times a day you are expected to pray. And so that gives a real structure, a real rhythm to your daily life, doesn't it? They also show Sunni Muslims putting their faith first, actually putting their faith into action in their everyday life. And again, that's reflecting the fact that religion isn't just something that you believe in, but it's also something that you practice. It's something that you do, that it has an impact on the things that you do in this world, in this lifetime. And although many of the beliefs are about things that have happened in the past, for example, the things that happened 1400 years ago with the revelation of the Quran to Muhammad, and also things that will happen in the future, you know, your hopes for eternal life in paradise after you've died but also that has a massive impact on the things you do now and that's why these five pillars are so important because they show you prioritizing your faith your religion in your life today putting those beliefs that you have into action they also bring Sunni Muslims closer to God and ensure they focus on him every day. As I say, these practices are derived from the Quran, which is seen as the infallible revealed word of God. And so, you know, by performing these five pillars in your life, you are able to honor God, to develop a relationship with him, to fulfill his wishes for you in terms of how you will live your life. And they also help Muslims achieve the reward of life after death in paradise. So obviously very important. Remember, you're only in this lifetime, in this world, sorry, for a very short amount of time, aren't you? Compared to the eternity that you'll be spending either in paradise or in hell. And so it's really important that you have these five pillars to guide you in terms of how to live your life in this world so that you will be able to enjoy eternal life in paradise after death. So very, very important in terms of linking to Muslim beliefs about judgment day and life after death. Now, at the bottom of the screen here, I've just made a note that we need to be thinking of our AO2. We don't just want to know as we go through today's video what the practices are, what the five pillars are, for example, although we will be covering each of these in detail. We need to start evaluating which one might be most important. So, for example, you know, is it Shahada? Because if you know, if you don't have Shahada, the declaration of faith, you then aren't going to have all of the other practices because it really does lay the foundation 
Or could you argue that actually they are five equal pillars, that actually they have equal importance, that you couldn't um, live a Muslim life without any one of them? So I just want you to sort of start thinking in terms of your AO2, to start evaluating, to start critiquing, if you like, which of the five pillars might be the most important or whether actually in a potential 12 marker, you would be concluding that they all have equal importance. So just keeping our minds on those 12 mark questions, which of course take up 50% of our marks. Now, alongside those five pillars, we also need to know the 10 obligatory acts of Shia Islam. Now, uh, you will see some crossovers here, but then obviously you see some that are unique. So we again have Salah, compulsory prayer, although for uh, Shia Muslims, they may sometimes combine uh, the times of prayer into three times of prayer. It's the same number of rakas, uh, 17 rakas, but they may combine it into three times of prayer throughout the day. And we'll look at when they will be in a moment's time. We've also there got Psalm, which is fasting during Ramadan, Zakat, which is obligatory giving, but then uh, Shia Muslims also have Qums, which we'll talk about in a moment, and Hajj, which is pilgrimage to Mecca. And remember on Hajj, it really is all about unity. The idea of you know, the oneness of the worldwide Islamic community coming together, three million people um, you know, coming together to worship God in the holiest place on the planet. Um, so then in addition to this, for uh, Shia Muslims, we've got Qums, as I say, which is this extra 20% taxation, which we'll look at later. We've got Jihad, which is striving to overcome evil. And there are two types of Jihad we need to know. The inner struggle, which is um, the struggle to overcome evil within yourself, so discipline in yourself, that daily striving to be a better person against your own selfish desires, for example, and then the outer struggle. So that's about striving to overcome evil in the outside world. And that is where we have the link to theme D, because we're talking about defending the religion from external threats. So we're talking about holy war. And again, start to think, is it more important to focus on the inner struggle or the outer struggle as a modern Muslim? Um, we'll then be looking at some that are very specific we won't actually, I've just told a lie there. I do apologise, that's terrible of me. We don't then need to know any more detail about these final four here. They obviously are important as some of the 10 obligatory acts, but it's not obligatory for us to have any deeper knowledge for this exam on them. So encouraging good actions, discouraging evil actions, association with good people and disassociation with evil people. I want to mention them there because they do make up the 10 obligatory acts. But for this exam, I don't want you to worry yourself with any more detail on those. But what I do want you to just do for this moment, please, is have a think about why these 10 obligatory acts of Shia Islam are important. So, again, they guide Shia Muslims in how to live their everyday lives, don't they? They give a blueprint, if you like, for how to conduct yourself, for the practices you should be performing on that daily basis. They unite Shia Muslims and give meaning to their lives. Again, it's something that all uh, followers of this denomination can have uh, as an agreement, if you like. It's something to have in common. It helps Shia Muslims achieve the reward of paradise after death and avoid the punishment of hell because it's ensuring that you're performing good practices, especially when it comes to encouraging good actions, discouraging evil actions and associating with good people and avoiding evil people. You are making sure you're resisting temptation. You are making sure that everything you do in your life, that all of the practices you perform are God centered and they are all about doing good and you know helping people for example and strengthening your relationship with God and also they help Shia Muslims to focus their everyday lives towards God so again it keeps your mind focused on God on following his teachings for example those that are in the Quran um, and being a good Muslim which of course is important in terms of life after death in terms of pleasing God um, you know and being held to account on judgment day um, after you have died. OK, let's start with our first pillar then, shall we? And it is Shahada, which is the first of the five pillars of Sunni Islam. Now, here it is on the screen for you. It is that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Now, interestingly, for Shia Muslims, the Shahada is a belief 
rather than a practice. So you will notice it wasn't actually on our list of obligatory acts. But of course, um, Shia Muslims also agree that there is no God but Allah uh, and that Muhammad is his messenger. Remember this fundamental belief that we know in Islam of Tawid, the oneness of God, that there is one God and then that Muhammad is his messenger, that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. Remember, 124,000 prophets, but it is Muhammad who is the seal of the prophets who um, the angel Jibril appears to and reveals the words of the Quran to. And so Muhammad, even though he's illiterate, is able to recite these words. And that is the beginning of Islam. He then goes on to form the first Islamic community. And we now have over two billion Muslims in the world today. Now, for Shia Muslims, just important to note as well, they have a slightly different version of the Shahada because Shia Muslims add on. So they agree that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. But they then add on and Ali is the friend of God. And you will remember this links back to that key idea of the imamate which we spoke about in the beliefs and teachings video, and that key question of the succession to the Prophet Muhammad after his death, which led to the Sunni Shia split. So just important to note. In terms then of what this first pillar is, and you know, I want you to start thinking, is it the first pillar for a reason? Is it because this pillar is the most important and that the other pillars wouldn't be possible if you didn't have Shahada as the first foundation of your faith? Um, but this is the simple yet profound statement expressing a Muslim's complete acceptance of and commitment to Islam. So, you know, it really is at the core of the religion. It's expressing this belief of Taweed. So it's putting it into practice, if you like, isn't it? It reminds Muslims of Taweed, uh, which is, of course, viewed as a fundamentally important Islamic belief. And it reminds Muslims as well of the importance of the Prophet Muhammad, of course, um, and the Quran, which he revealed. So it really encapsulates, doesn't it, the key beliefs and teachings. And that's why I say these practices are all about putting those key beliefs and teachings into practice, believe it or not. Now, what is the Shahada? And so why is it therefore important? Really interesting. The Shahada is whispered into the ears of newborn babies. So it is the first thing they hear. So the father will traditionally whisper the words of the Shahada into the baby's right ear um, as soon as they're born. So it is the first words that they hear that from the moment they are born, they are being called to God. And so that is a really important purpose of the Shahada, that it is the first words a newborn baby born into an Islamic family, of course, that they will hear. It is then recited during the call to prayer and Salah. So again, we can link it to another pillar and we can say, well, it plays a fundamental part in another pillar because this is how you are actually called to prayer. So the Adam, this calls you to prayer. You're being called to God because you're being reminded of the fact that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. It is repeated when someone wishes to convert to Islam with a witness for example, an imam present. So again, it is the first words any Muslim will ever hear. That is how important it is. And so again, is this the most important practice? Because it is the first thing you should ever hear. So it's your first Islamic practice, I suppose, isn't it? Even though, of course, you're only hearing those words. Um, it's said before death as well to demonstrate a commitment to the religion of Islam. So it's not only the first words you hear, but it's also the last words you hear, demonstrating the importance of the Shahada from the moment that you are born all the way through your life, every single day when you hear the call to prayer, all the way through to your death. So from your birth until your death, that is how important the Shahada is. And it is then a reminder for Muslims to bear witness to the truth of Islam by sharing it with Others. So again, it is such an important practice because it's actually that declaration of your faith. So it's actually verbalizing the beliefs that you hold. Um, now, as I say, we want to be thinking about our AO2. We want to be asking, is Shahada the most important pillar? So you could say, in terms of your reasons to agree in your 12th marker, that yes, it is, because it is the declaration of faith. That is how important it is. In order to be a Muslim and practice the other pillars, this pillar has to come first. And so we can say it sums up the Islamic faith. And so it is the first pillar for a reason. Without it, the others are not possible. It lays the foundation for living an Islamic life because it contains the key essential Islamic belief, Tawid. And you could also say it is the first of the five pillars. It is the first words you hear as a Muslim. So, you know, you're not going to be born and go on Hajj straight away, are you, as a newborn baby? Shahada is the first thing that you will be hearing. 
This suggests that it comes before or it underpins other pillars in the same way that it is the call to prayer, that you can't pray or you're not praying without hearing the words of the Shahada, that again, Shahada comes first, that it lays the foundation to encourage you to partake in the other practices. Again, if I think about Hajj, you know, why are we going on Hajj? It's because, you know, this is where Muhammad began the religion. Um, and so again, we're thinking, well, the Shahada teaches us that. It teaches us that Muhammad is his messenger. We won't be going on Hajj to, you know, see the birthplace of the prophet if we didn't have the Shahada first, if that makes sense. So it's laying the foundations, it's summing up the faith, and it's then inspiring the other pillars, you could say. And then you can also say it is spoken throughout the day, for example, the call to prayer and throughout your life, for example, at birth and just before death. Again, showing its importance. How do you go once in your life? Whereas Shahada, you're hearing, you know, several times a day. So really reaffirming to us its significance. Um, and again, if you're contrasting it with Psalm, you know, you're fasting in the month of Ramadan. But why are you fasting? Because you believe Muhammad is the messenger of God, that this, this holy month is when he revealed the Quran. And that is, again, based on the Shahada, the idea that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. So if you can see what I'm doing here, I'm sort of linking the other pillars back to Shahada. And I'm saying the reason that those pillars are important is because Shahada comes first. Um, however, of course, for a 12 marker, you're giving both sides of the argument. So to disagree, I could say, actually, no, all the pillars are equally important. They are all duties that should be performed. One cannot be singled out from the others. They are called the five pillars for a reason. You need all of them. Without one of them, it doesn't make sense. Or you know, it, it's not sustainable to, you know, to be really basic, if I can, you know, be basic. <laughs> there are five pillars for a reason. You know, that's why it's not the one pillar of Islam. There are five pillars. And so one cannot be singled out from the others. They are all equally important for, you know, underpinning the religion. Without one of them, you wouldn't be living an Islamic life. You need all five. You could also, though, say that others are more important. So, you know, in terms of your evaluation, because you could say, well, actually, Salah is more important because it happens five times a day and is about making regular communication with God. It is more practical. And so, you know, you could say, well, yeah, Shahada calls you to prayer with the words of the Adhan, but actually Salah itself is where you're developing that relationship with God. And surely that's actually more important. You could also say Zakah is more important as it involves helping others in a practical way. And so it means doing things to help others. And we could say, well, that's actually particularly important. That's going to be rewarded by God. But then, of course, to sort of respond to that, I could say, but the reason that you are doing Zakah is because of the Shahada, because you have this key first pillar that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting to be evaluating this in terms of, is this the most important pillar? So, yeah, I hope that's given you a bit of food for thought and you've started to think, why would someone agree that it is the most important pillar? Whereas why might someone say they're all equal or that actually other pillars could even be more important? Um, so on that note, let's move on to a second pillar, shall we, which is Salah. So we're going to talk about prayer now. And I want to start by just sharing with you some scripture. You might want to make a note on a post-it note, for example, that you could use in particular for your question four and your question five answers. Now, you don't need to know the exact surahs. You do just need to be able to say in the Quran it says. Um, so I have included the specifics here just in case you want to go away and do some more reading, for example, or look at different translations um, that may be available. So our first key quote is Sarah 62. Remember God often so that you may prosper. And of course, you know, having prayer five times or three times a day helps you to remember God often, doesn't it? And so Muslims believe that will help you succeed in life. Um, Surah 96 says to prostrate and draw near to God. Surah 2 says to turn your face in the direction of the sacred mosque when you pray. So we'll be looking at that practice of whenever a Muslim prays, they are facing in, in the direction, excuse me, of the Kaaba, of Mecca. That is really important um, in terms of how Muslims pray. Surah 51, I think, yeah, Surah 51 says, I created mankind to worship me. A brilliant quote from the Quran there saying that the purpose of life is to worship God. And so that emphasizes to us why Salah is so important. And then God also says in Surah 40, call on me and I will answer you. So this idea that prayer has a really 
positive benefit because by praying you can communicate with God develop a relationship with him that he can respond to you that he can strengthen you support you and help you so <coughs> you excuse me Salah is prayer. And as I've put here um, on the screen, Shia Muslims can pray three times a day, um, whereas Sunni Muslims pray five times a day. But both of them pray for what we call 17 sequences. And we're going to talk about this more in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to just talk about when these times are. So there are five times a day for Salah, for Sunni Muslims. Each Salah is preceded by the Adan, the call to prayer. So you hear the call to prayer, the call to prayer goes out in an Islamic country, um, and then people will obviously respond to that, respond to the call by praying. And the five times that we have are at sunrise, at noon, in the afternoon, sunset, and then at night. Now, Shia Muslims, as I've put here, often pray at three times a day. They may offer the noon and afternoon prayer together, and then the sunset and night prayer together as well. So you're combining those prayers at those times so you are praying at three distinct times as opposed to at five distinct times in the day now this is because muhammad the prophet muhammad sometimes did this and it might be seen as a way of making prayer or praying more practical because you know if you've got a busy day for example you know you've got a busy life now you could respond and say well you know you should never be too busy to pray um, but we're saying here, the key idea here is that it is possible, it does happen within Shia Islam to actually pray at three times a day as opposed to five. But you are still performing the same number of sequences, the same number of rakas. Um, now, as I've put here, Salah must be offered in Arabic and from memory using set prayers from the Quran, the Sunnah and the Hadith. Um, now, proper Salah must start with wudu, which is ritual washing and cleansing of the body and mind and establishing niya, which is right intention. So you need to have that cleansing. So you need to be spiritually and physically cleansed and also have the right intention before you start praying, really important. Uh, now, men should, as far as possible, offer salah in a mosque, especially on a Friday, Friday prayers, Jumma prayers, which we'll talk about in a moment. Salah can often also be offered at home uh, by men and women. And of course, it could also be in a prayer room, you know, for example, in a hospital or a place of work or even a school. Now, Qibla refers to the direction of Mecca, which Muslims face when they pray wherever they are. And this is why Hajj is then very significant, because when you then actually go to Mecca, when you actually see the Kaaba with your own eyes before you, that is obviously going to be a very overwhelming experience, isn't it? Because you've spent your lifetime praying in this direction and then you go on Hajj and you're actually there for yourself. But yes. Every time Muslims pray, they are facing the direction of Mecca. So it's really important that you are calculating that, you're working that out, uh, you know, if you're praying at home, for example, so that you make sure you're praying in the right direction, that you are praying in the right spiritual state. So you've performed wudu and with the right intention. So, you know, lots of things go into preparing for prayer, don't they? And getting yourself ready. Now, Salah will usually begin with the takbir, which is that Allah is the greatest. Now, we need to talk about rakas and recitations, and I've got a little diagram here to show you what I mean. So these are carried out five times every day for Sunni Muslims, and Shia Muslims may combine them to three times daily. Now, both Sunni and Shia Muslims total 17 sequences of prayer each day by, by way excuse me, of rakas and recitations, and that just refers to movements and the words that you say to accompany those movements. For example, verses from uh, the Quran, a Quranic recitation. Each sequence of movements, each raka, has a number of different physical positions, and you can see them demonstrated on the screen there with that little visual. Um, now, each, um, as I say, each sequence has a different number of physical positions, and each one includes saying aloud a Quranic recitation, and that is why it's known as movements and words. And as I say, we have that sequence demonstrated for you there. And the idea is that over the course of the day, whether that's five times for Sunni Muslims or combined to three times for Shia Muslims, you are performing 17 of these sequences in total. Now, important in terms of, again, the distinction between Sunni and Shia beliefs about prayer, we've got sujud, which means kneeling down with, a for, with the forehead, excuse me, touching the prayer mat. For a Shia Muslim, that would be touching the wooden block. 
So they would have a wooden block instead of their forehead touching the prayer mat. A Shia Muslim would have a wooden block, which their forehead is touching instead. So that is another key difference you could refer to. Now, the idea of sujud, so this, um, as you can see from F there and D, this kneeling down with the forehead touching the prayer mat, this shows total submission to God. And remember, the word Islam actually means submission to God, doesn't it? So it's this idea of bowing down and prostrating, which we know from Surah 96. So it's this idea of physically submitting to God, emphasizing what you said with the takbir, that Allah is the greatest. You are physically showing that by bowing down to him. So, you know, the beliefs about God being omnipotent, for example, they are then shown when you pray because you are bowing down to him. You know, you are physically showing that, showing that total submission to God, submission to his will. So those ideas of predestination that we know from beliefs and teachings, and that idea, you know, that before God, you are humbled, you know, and you are in full submission to him and to his will. And as I say, we've got those 17 sequences a day, the 17 sequences that you will perform um, of rakas, um, which obviously are those movements that are performed along with the Quranic recitation. Now, I've got a little bit more to tell you about prayer. I want to give you a few quotes. So Surah 62 says, when the call to prayer is made on the day of congregation, hurry towards the reminder of God and leave off your trading. That is better for you if only you knew. So talking about Friday prayers, this expectation in Islamic country that you will leave your trading, you'll leave your work, you'll leave your business and you'll go and pray because prayer is so important. It takes priority over everything else that you might be doing. And we see this in one of the hadiths, which says that prayer is better than sleep. Now, we also see in the hadiths this belief that prayer, and remember the hadiths are the teachings of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, that prayer with the congregation is 27 times better than prayer performed by oneself. So in the exam, you could be asked to compare praying at home independently with praying at the mosque, for example, with the congregation. Um, and the Hadith support this idea that it's uh, better to pray at the mosque when you can, because prayer with the congregation is better than prayer alone. However, the Hadiths also say that the whole earth has been made a place of worship. And so actually, um, in terms of evaluating the idea of whether it's better to pray at the mosque or at home, you could say it doesn't matter where you pray, because actually everything you do, wherever you go, is an act of worship, because the entire world is a place of worship that has been created by God. Uh, and that's a great link, of course, to theme B, religion and life. Um, and then I've got a quote for you from Malik Ibn Dinar, who said, a believer in a mosque is like a fish in water. So the idea that, you know, the mosque is the spiritual home for a Muslim, that it's, you know, where you are going to be most at home, where you are going to learn lots, of course, you're going to feel close to God um, and it's going to enrich your life. So, yeah, we want to be thinking about where prayer actually takes place now. So Juma prayer is Friday prayers, and this is congregational prayers at the mosque at noon on Friday. So, of course, as we know, one of the five times a day to pray for Sunni Muslims is at noon. Um, and on a Friday, this is particularly important. Uh, now, prayers, the five prayers a day are said at the mosque every day. But as I say, Friday is the particularly important day. And so these uh, noon prayers on a Friday, the Jummah prayers, the Friday prayers are the best attended of the week. Now for Sunni Muslims, it is seen as compulsory for men um, to attend at the mosque. And it is believed that great rewards will come from this. Now, women can also go and pray at the mosque, but they can also pray at home as well. If they do go to the mosque, they will pray separately from the men. Um, but it is seen as compulsory for men. Now, for Shia Muslims, it is not necessary to actually go to the mosque for Friday prayers in the absence of the 12th imam. So again, a link there to the ideas of the imamate from the beliefs and teachings video. Now, in, in terms of what actually happens, the adhan is called and wudu, so that ritual um, cleansing uh, spiritually and physically, uh, is performed. The MM will deliver a sermon called the Kutba, excuse me, on an issue relevant to the community. So that will be, you know, talking about the specific issues that they're facing, you know, for example, 
uh, after COVID, for example, you know, talking about things that affect that local Islamic community. Um, and attending Jummah prayer means that Muslims can learn from the Imam and then, of course, worship together, which develops that sense of community, which is absolutely crucial for Muslims. It also helps to bring about the forgiveness of sins. So, you know, really important in terms of this congregational worship, because you are learning, you are coming together. Um, it's strengthening the community. It's strengthening your sense of belonging to the Ummah, to the worldwide Islamic community. And then it's also helping you in terms of facilitating the forgiveness of sins. However, as I say, you can also, as a Muslim, pray at home. Uh, and the Hadith say, pray in your houses. Do not make them like graveyards. So the house is expected to be a place of prayer in terms of your five prayers a day, for example, but also in terms of extra prayers, which can be performed at home. Um, and they could be called um, naf nafla or sunnah. Now, these are more personal. So obviously with your set prayers, with your salat set prayers, you know, there is an expectation that you will follow the rakas and that you will follow the, the uh, plan, the schedule, if you like, the script, shall I say. Whereas there is also an opportunity for more personal prayer, where you have this time for opening up to God, who is always there to hear prayers. God is omnipresent. And, um, you know, God is obviously omniscient, omnipotent. So he is always there to hear prayers. Remember, he is both transcendent and imminent. Now, you may, for example, ask for help, for forgiveness, for support. Now, do a prayer are personal prayers. They are prayers of invocation, supplication, or request. And they can often be said by families during meal times, to break fast, or on special occasions, for example, Eid. So it's important you know that we have these set prayers, the Salah, which are performed five times a day or three times a day, potentially for Shia Muslims. And then you also have Dua prayer, which is personal prayer. These additional extra prayers where you can pray for help, you know, or you can pray for forgiveness or support. So really important, you know, that there are these different types of prayer. And I've just put them at the top there. I've said Salah is formal prayer five times a day or sometimes combined to free by some Shia Muslims. And then do a prayer, which is that personal prayer, that, you know, more spontaneous prayer, I suppose, um, where you are making a prayer of invocation, supplication or request. Now, we've got to ask, of course, why is prayer important for Muslims? As I've said, the Hadith say prayer is better than sleep. So we want to work out why might this be? Why do Muslims believe that prayer is important? First of all, of course, it's one of the five pillars, which emphasizes that it is essential, that it underpins the entire religion, that to live an Islamic life means praying. It is so important for living that Islamic life. It is established by the Prophet Muhammad and it is instructed by the Quran. So in terms of, in terms, excuse me, of your sources of wisdom and authority, we see the key beliefs about this from the surahs in the Quran, but also from the hadith, from the sayings of the Prophet. You know, we know that it is from Muhammad himself that we have this practice of praying in Islam, showing why it's so important. He's described as the perfect man. He is the exemplar for Muslims. So his teachings need to be followed. His practices need to be implemented in your life. And one of the most important is prayer. Um, it is a way of establishing a direct and lasting relationship with God. As I say, God is not just transcendent and outside the universe. God is imminent. He is closer to you than your jugular vein. So it's really important as a Muslim, you're developing that relationship with God. And prayer is a great way to do that. It helps Muslims to attain God consciousness and is a reminder of the importance of God as the focus of their lives. You know, if you're praying five times a day, that means that your entire day is punctuated with these reminders of God, you know, where you are developing this relationship with him, that God is involved, if you like, with your daily life. And so it develops God consciousness that you are always thinking about God, you're honoring God, you're thanking God and you're fulfilling God's will in terms of how you live your life. Um, it helps Muslims to avoid sin, including shirk, which, of course, is when you are worshipping idols because you are focusing on God. You are hearing that call to prayer. You're hearing that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. So that's reminding you of Taweed, the oneness of God. And then you're putting that into practice by actually worshipping him. You are showing, you know, with the um, rakas, you are showing that full submission to him, aren't you? When you are physically submitting to God. So it's constantly helping you to avoid sin because you are physically showing your submission to God. And therefore you are going to be following his teachings throughout the rest of your day. You know, the fact that you've got prayer at the very beginning of your day 
and then throughout your day ensures that all of your actions should then also be honoring God, that God is at the center of your life, that you are being reminded of him, of his teachings, of the need to submit to him and to follow his teachings as found in the Quran, for example. Um, it's also important to note that the first question a Muslim will be asked on the day of judgment is about Salah. So they will be asked about their prayer habits, their prayer practices. And so that shows prayer is important in order to achieve paradise. And so you need to be praying in order to enter paradise. So a great link there to judgment day that you will be judged based on your prayer practices. And then finally, prayer at the mosque, as we've said, strengthens the community. It brings people together. It unites them in their obviously place of worship and so it's strengthening the community and your relationship with your local islamic community with that local congregation and so again it has real value not just for the individual but for the local islamic community as well now i want you to also be thinking of course about some potential aot questions so are prayers for men and women equally important for example when it's only men who um are obliged to attend the friday prayers are prayers at the mosque or home more important? How often should you pray? Does it matter whether it's five times, three times, 50 times or one time, for example? Um, and then again, is prayer the most important pillar? You know, do you think this is the most important pillar? Why might someone agree that it is? Why might someone say that actually another pillar is more important? Or, of course, that they are all equally as important. OK, we're going to move on to our next practice now, which is Psalm. And that is, of course, Fasting, very important for Muslims during the month of Ramadan. And we're going to find out why that is now. Before we do that, let's just start with our scripture. Absolutely key for securing our marks in questions four and questions five. So Surah 2 says, you who believe fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you so that you may be mindful of God. So that emphasizes why Psalm is so important because it's prescribed by the Quran. It's an instruction you are given by the Holy Book. Remember, it is the word of God. So what the Quran is saying is, you know, so important for Muslims that you must put that into practice in your life. You must follow its teachings, the commands that have been given from God, because it is the word of God. And the uh, Surah 2 also says why this is, that fasting encourages you to be mindful of God. And we'll think about how that might happen through fasting in a minute. Surah 2 also says fast for a specific number of days. But if one of you is ill or on a journey, then on other days. So Surah 2, they're talking about the fact that fasting is expected during Ramadan for that specific number of days during the holy month. But it does then say what the exceptions are, that if you're ill or you're on a journey, then there is an exemption there that you can make up for it on other days or actually with a donation, which we'll talk about more. Surah 2 also says it was in the month of Ramadan that the Quran was revealed. So any one of you who sees in that month should fast. So that's telling us why fasting takes place during Ramadan, because it is the month during which the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad via the angel Jibril. So we're actually talking now about why Psalm happens, why it's important and why it happens during Ramadan, because it's all about being mindful of God, because this is the holy month when the Quran was revealed. And then Surah 2 again says, fast until nightfall. So in terms of the logistics of Psalm, when you should be fasting, how you should be fasting, you of course come together as a family uh, in the evenings after nightfall in order to break the fast. So what is fasting? What is Psalm? Well, uh, fasting is the fourth pillar. The main period of fasting is during Ramadan, which is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. Now, healthy adults are expected to take part in the fast during Ramadan. Now, those exempt, so those who are excused from this, include the elderly and the youngest, those who are traveling, as we've seen in Surah 2, and those who are ill and unwell, again, as we see there in Surah 2. The Quran says those who do not fast should do so at another time or help the needy. And we get that from Surah 1. So we are told who is exempt, but then we're also told what those people should be doing. Now, when fasting during daylight hours in Ramadan, remember Surah 2 says to fast until nightfall, you should not only, and this is often something we forget, you should not only abstain from food and drink, but you should also abstain from smoking, from sexual activity, from bad thoughts and bad deeds. So it's fasting in terms of food and drink, but it actually goes much wider. You shouldn't just be abstaining from food and drink and then, you know, 
doing awful things during the day. You are abstaining not only from food and drink, but from smoking, sexual activity, from bad thoughts and bad deeds. And again, it's all about developing this God consciousness, this mindfulness of God. And Psalm is about remembering the night of power when Angel Jibril revealed the Quran to Muhammad. It is at the end of Ramadan. So, you know, the month of Ramadan is leading up to this night of power, which is the, obviously this very significant moment in Islamic history, because without it, you would not have the Quran. What are the benefits of Psalm then? What are the benefits of fasting for Muslims? Well, in terms of religious reasons, it develops that devotion to God, doesn't it? It brings you closer to him. You know, think about it. If you are fasting, it's something you're going to be very conscious of. So you're going to always be remembering when you're feeling hungry, for example, you know, of the reason that you're doing it. So it's a way of developing that God consciousness of developing your relationship with God, um, of also developing concern and sympathy for those in need. You know, so you're thinking about those who you help through Zakat, for example, because you're experiencing the hunger that they experience throughout the year. So it's developing that concern, that sympathy, that compassion that is so important. And as I say, that links to that other key pillar, that pillar of Zaka. It develops self-discipline and self-control. Remember, you're not only abstaining from food and drink, but also things like smoking, sex, bad thoughts and bad deeds. So it's all about self-discipline. And that links, of course, to jihad, to the inner struggle, doesn't it? to overcome evil. So really important for that practice, that cultivation of self-discipline and self-control, which is so important for Muslims to be developing. And finally, it brings the Islamic community together. You know, as you break the fast in the evenings, for example, after nightfall, you come together as a family, you know, as an extended family, perhaps as a community as well. So it's something that is observed collectively and so it uh, strengthens the community. It's a practice which builds community relationships. It absolutely brings people together. And so, you know, that is, again, a benefit of SORM because it brings the Islamic community together. Very important, reflecting the oneness of God. You know, Taweed, you want to then strengthen the oneness of the community. And so that leads me on, as we like to do, to our question of the importance of the pillar. Yeah. Why is this pillar important? And I've got a few points here for you. Number one is that it is one of the five pillars and one of the 10 obligatory acts. And so it is the foundational practice for Muslims. It helps to develop devotion to God, as we've said. It brings you closer to him. It increases your appreciation for his provision. You know, we can, can't we take it for granted throughout the year? You know, that we've got access to food, that we eat when we want, that we get all these delicious meals. But actually, it's only when you stop that, when you consciously fast, that you realize how much you appreciate it and how much is valued isn't it if you can see what I mean there so it, as I say increases your appreciation for his provision you stop taking it for granted uh, and it develops gratitude we often only realize how much we've taken something for granted as soon as we don't have it it's a bit like when you get ill isn't it you know I always think that when I get sick I take it for granted that I don't usually have a sore throat you know that I'm not usually feeling like death um, and it is only when you don't have something that you then appreciate it. But then, of course, it's too late. So this practice once a year means that for the rest of the year, you have much greater gratitude um, and much greater appreciation. We could say that it is a blessing, not a burden. It's seen very much as a blessing rather than a burden by Muslims. It develops. Uh, self-restraint, which obviously is seen as a very good thing by Muslims, very important in terms of giving a good Islamic life and therefore being rewarded with life after death. Um, and it's thought to have those health benefits. You know, we do see fasting in many different religions, in many different cultures as well. So in terms of as a social practice more generally, um, you know, fasting is seen to have health benefits. It shows obedience to God and his will, which, of course, is so important, that idea of submission, whether you're physically showing that in your prayer, when you are bowing down to God, you're prostrating, but also when you are then fasting as well. Everything is about showing that obedience to God and to his will. It helps to develop that self-discipline and control. It helps develop concern for and sympathy with the poor and an understanding of the importance of charity. So, of course, linking to Zakat there, very important, another one of our five pillars. So it's, you know, really um, emphasizing to you the importance of that pillar because you're developing that empathy that concern for the poor because you're thinking well if this is how I just feel 
and I then get to break my fast at nightfall, what about those people that don't then get to break the fast? They are just spending every day, every week, every month um, without any food and drink, you know, so it develops that concern for and sympathy for those who are in need. So again, emphasizing to you the importance of one of the other pillars as well. So it's not only developing that self-discipline, but it's also developing that concern for the suffering of others as well. Um, it helps Muslims to remember the importance of the Quran, which, of course, was first revealed during Ramadan, the night of power. So it's keeping you God focused, developing your God consciousness and, you know, reminding you of the significance of this month. It is a very important month to mark. And this practice, the practice of fasting during Ramadan, keeps your mind on the importance, on the holiness of the month so that you're not being distracted, for example, you know, by these physical worldly pleasures of eating and drinking and, you know, whatever else. It keeps your mind focused. And of course, as I say, it brings the community together and it strengthens their unity. You know, it's very much seen as a blessing. This is very much a, an act of thanks to God, an act of submission to God, but it's something that you're doing collectively. You're in it together. You're breaking the fast together. And, you know, you're on this faith journey together as a community. OK, let's talk about Zakat then, shall we? Because we've just said that Psalm helps to develop a sympathy for and a concern for those in need. And then Zakat is all about putting that into practice. It's all about actually doing something to help those people. We're also going to look at Qums as well, which is linked to Shia Islam. And it's an additional uh, tax, an obligatory 20% tax that Shia Muslims pay. In terms of our scriptural foundations, then Surah 2 says, whatever you spend with a good heart, give it to parents, relatives, orphans, the helpless and travelers in need. Whatever good you do, Allah is aware of it. So the importance of helping those in need. Surah 9 says, alms are only for the poor and the needy and those who collect them, those whose hearts are to be reconciled, captives, debtors in the cause of Allah and wayfarers. So we'll be looking at who actually then receives zakat. So obviously we'll be looking at who is expected to pay this, but then who actually receives this. And then Surah 8, which reflects um, for Shia Muslims comes, know that whatever other thing you acquire, a fifth of it, so 20% of it is for God. Um, for the messenger, for the near relative and the orphans, the needy and the wayfarer. And we'll be asking um, who, as I say, receives comes as well. So zakat, first of all, is charity. So it means charity and it's a directive from the Quran. So as with all of these pillars we've looked at, you know, the foundation for the practice, for the pillar is in scripture. It's in the Quran. It's something we are told or something that Muslims are told to do by the Quran. It is a religious obligation. So obviously it is an obligatory act. It's a five, one of the five pillars. It is something that you are required to do. And it's all about purifying your wealth. So it's the idea that if you are paying this 2.5% um, of your income to the mosque for distribution to, you know, those in need, it purifies your remaining wealth. So it purifies the money that you then do have and that you do then spend on yourself and your family, for example. So it's all about purifying your wealth. The idea that you give some of it away, a small percent of it away to help those in need. And that then purifies the rest of the money that you have, that you've earned, that you've saved, that you spend. Now, this all links back to the idea that wealth is on loan from God. And so some of it should be used to help others. Yeah, it's all about, again, this development of God consciousness, of this submission to God, of this appreciation for what you have in this world. Um, and it is then about a concern for other people. You know, you aren't just here to be selfish and think of your own needs. You've got to have a concern for the wider community as well, reflecting, again, the oneness of God, Tawid, and then the oneness of humanity that God has created everybody. And so everybody, you know, deserves to have happiness in their lives, for example. Now, to help each other is seen as helping God and giving should therefore be done willingly as God knows all intentions. Children do not have to pay Zakat, but some guardians may do so on their behalf. However, all adults who do meet the criteria must give. So for the exam, we need to know what Zakat is. We need to know who pays it and who then receives that money. And we know that all adults who meet the criteria must give. Um, now, in Muslim countries, Muslims pay zakah as Sharia law prescribes. 
And then Muslims in the West can give a cash equivalent. So they might give it to an Islamic charity, for example, who then distribute it. So who can then facilitate it? But remember, it's a directive from the Quran. It is so important for Sunni Muslims to be fulfilling this pillar in order to purify their wealth, in order to help other people, um, and it, in order to, you know, honor God, to submit to God and his will. Now, the Nisab threshold, and this is important to note, is the minimum amount that a Muslim must have before being obliged to pay zakat. So if you were asked in the exam about who pays zakat, it is those who meet the Nisab threshold. So those whose income, who have the amount of money um, in order to be obliged. So obviously, if you are in poverty yourself, you're not going to be obliged to pay this. Whereas it is once you have met that NISA threshold that you would be obliged to pay Zakat. So that is how it's calculated. Now, for Shia Muslims, there is then also Qums, which means, as I've said, a fifth. And we see that in Surah 8. Now, it is the sixth of the 10 obligatory acts of Shia Islam. This is a tax that is paid on any profits earned by Shia Muslims. So remember, you've got this 2.5%, which is Zakat, but then for Shia Muslims, you've also got Qums, which is this 20% as well, so significantly higher. Now, traditionally, recipients of this have been uh, decided by Shia leaders. For example, it would be the descendants of Muhammad, as you can see there from Surah 8, it says, for the near relative, and that again is reflecting this idea of the imamat in uh, Shia, Shia Islam, excuse me. Um, it can also refer to those within the Shia Islamic faith and those who need it. So the key distinction here is that zakat, which is one of the five pillars, is 2.5%, whereas Qums is this additional taxation for Shia Muslims where they are paying 20%, they're paying a fifth, and then it is then the Shia leaders who will decide where that money goes, how that money is distributed. The importance of Qums then is that it gives special recognition to Muhammad, his descendants, and his, and then of course the leaders within Shia Islam, again reflecting the imamate, which of course we saw with the Shahada saying that an Ali is his friend, that it is then the near relatives, the descendants of Muhammad, who have this special recognition in Shia Islam. And again, please be familiarize yourself with um, the imamate. It's used to help build Islamic schools or projects chosen by Shia leaders. So it makes a difference in terms of knowledge about Islam and teaching people about the religion, which is very important, of course. It helps those in need and it promotes um, Islam through education, as I've said. And of course, remember, it is one of the 10 obligatory acts. So it is a requirement for Shia Muslims. In terms of zakat, then, uh, in general, as one of the five pillars, what is the importance of zakat? Why do you need to pay this, this 2.5% sum? And, you know, what is its value? What is its significance? So obviously the first point is that it is to purify and cleanse your wealth. Uh, you know, giving this makes the remaining money you have clean. So it purifies the remaining money that you have. Sharing the blessings of wealth with others prevents greed. So again, linking to this idea of self-discipline, linking to this idea of the inner struggle of jihad, wanting to overcome greed and selfishness. Um, and so it facilitates moral development. The money benefits both the giver and the receiver. Muslims believe that the giver will receive 100 times back what they have given in the afterlife. And they should obviously feel a sense of satisfaction in the moment, but then they're also thinking, well, giving this now will lead to greater rewards and blessings after death. So it's kind of in, an investment, excuse me, in life after death, isn't it? It's an investment now, and you will then benefit from that in paradise. So very, very important, again, in terms of linking to life after death. If everyone gave zakat, then there would be no poor in the world. So linking there to that key idea of stewardship, of being a khalifa, which, of course, we know from theme B, this idea that you have this duty to make the world a better place. And this idea that if everybody did this, it would lead to significant social change. It would help the poorest and the most vulnerable in society. So it's a really good practice to be performing as a steward, as a khalifa who cares about the world. So a great link to theme B there. And finally, it fulfills your religious duty and obligation. Again, we see the foundations for this in scripture. We see the foundations for this in the Quran, which is the inerrant, infallible word of God. And so by putting this into practice, you are fulfilling your religious duties and obligations from God, which, of course, Muslims believe they must 
be doing. It is one of the five pillars. It upholds their faith. It upholds their religion. That alone should be enough to say why you need to do this, because it is a religious obligation, the origins of which, the foundations for which are found in Holy Scripture. So it's all about putting your beliefs into practice, following the teachings and examples set by Muhammad, um, and that will then earn you life in paradise. It will help you in terms of judgment day and then going to paradise after death. But yeah, just remember, Zakat is 2.5%. It's a directive from the Quran. Qums then is unique to Shia Islam, so it's unique for uh, Shia Muslims, and it is then that 20% additional taxation. Um, and then, as I say, where that money goes is decided by the Shia leaders, um, but it will traditionally go to the descendants of Muhammad um, and those within need um, as well. So very important, you know those two different um, concepts, Zakat and Qums, but then you're also considering why they're important. What is the purpose of this payment of money in terms of how it purifies your remaining wealth? Um, and then also it leads to greater blessings, both in this world, but also after death when you are in paradise. OK, we're going to move on to Hajj now. Um, and Hajj is pilgrimage to the house of God, to the Kaaba. And Sirah Free says that pilgrimage to the house is a duty owed to God by people who are able to undertake it. And this is from Surah Free. OK, now uh, Surah 2 also then says Safa and Mawa are among the rights of God. So for those who make major or minor pilgrimage to the house, it is no offence to circulate between the two. We are going to look now at what Hajj actually is what happens and we're going to be asking why is it important so what is hajj why is it important let me tell you shall i if the powerpoint will work do excuse me so hajj is pilgrimage that means a holy journey to mecca which is in modern day saudi arabia it is held annually in dul hijra it lasts five days and around three million muslims take part every year this is, of course, one of the five pillars of Islam. It is the fifth pillar of Islam. And the rituals that take place were established by Muhammad himself, again, emphasizing its importance. He is the perfect man. He is the seal of the prophets. He is the founder of Islam, which emphasizes why Hajj, inaugurated by him, is so important. Now, why do Muslims go to Mecca? Why is Mecca, in modern day Saudi Arabia, the destination of Hajj? Well, it is the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad, so it is the birthplace of Islam itself. It is home to the Kaaba, the holiest place. And as we said when we spoke about Salah, that is the direction that Muslims face whenever they pray. So whenever a Muslim prays five times a day, they are facing the Kaaba, they are facing Mecca. And so Hajj means you actually go there and you see it for yourself, that you're actually there in person. And obviously that is going to have a massive effect on you, isn't it? It's going to be very overwhelming, I would think. And it's going to lead to a closeness with God, a feeling of closeness with God, a strengthening of your faith. Um, so it is a journey to the most sacred place on earth. Muslims believe this is the most sacred place on earth. And it's the place that's at the heart of Islam. You know, the Kaaba there on the screen is seen as being at the heart of Islam because it is the house of God. It is the direction you face when you pray. And this is the holiest place in the world for Muslims. That is how important it is. Now, I will be breaking down the specific things that Muslims do on pilgrimage in just a moment. But I want to start by taking a look at the influence and the impact of going on Hajj of this once in a lifetime journey on Muslims. And this, of course, gives us an insight into why it is so important. So if you were asked in an exam question about, you know, why Hajj is important for Muslims, these points I'm going to give you here are fantastic examples of Hajj's importance. So what is the influence and the impact on Muslims of going on Hajj? Um, and I want to talk about the impact and influence on them whilst they are there, but also then the longer term impact it will have, because it's not something you're going to forget, is it? It's not something that you're going to do, and then it's not going to shape you or impact on you in your life going forwards. It is, I would expect, going to profoundly impact you. It's going to lead to a big change in your life. As I say, it's going to lead to a feeling of closeness with God, to a strengthening of your faith. So let's have a look, shall we? For example, sorry, just come to me, Malcolm X, 
um, wrote his letter from Hajj. He had a massive transformation in his thinking as a result of going on Hajj. And he wrote a letter called Letter from Hajj. <laughs> Very original title, I must say, um, which is something you might want to have a look at, actually, because it talks um, very well uh, uh, about how Hajj impacted him. Anyway, just gone on a completely different tangent there. Do excuse me. Think I need some green tea. I'm going a bit delirious. But yes, what is the impact of uh, Hajj on Muslims? What influence does it have and what can that tell us about this practice's importance? So whilst there, you will feel part of the United Ummah. Remember, three million people travelling for Hajj every year. So you're going to feel part of that United Ummah. It is the largest gathering of human beings in one place on earth. You will feel a sense of equality. Everybody's doing the same thing. They're wearing the same thing. So you're going to feel that oneness. Um, with the people that you are around you will feel closer to God you know you are at the house of God you are at the birthplace of your religion where you believe that God spoke to Muhammad through the angel Jibril and revealed to him the holy book that is at the center of Islamic practice the Quran and um, you'll feel strengthened in your faith because you are as I say at this most sacred place on earth it will remind you of what is important in your life um, it also is about the forgiveness of sins. So the forgiveness of sins allows for a fresh start and a new beginning. So as I say, it might be a moment of transformation and change in your life. Um, and obviously it's it's going to be emotional seeing the Kaaba with your own eyes for the first time. You know, you've always prayed in the direction of Mecca from, you know, your earliest days as a Muslim. And then you're actually there. You can actually see it for yourself. I think that will have a very profound impact on you, won't it? To actually be there after praying in this direction your entire lifetime. In terms of the longer term influence and impact, then it's going to lead to stronger faith. I would think, and a stronger relationship with God. You might have, you know, a new focus on your religion. Um, you will be more respected in the community. You can return home um, and you can share stories of your experience. Um, you will become perhaps a source of spiritual advice. You will be able to then share, as they say, insights, um, you know, and talk about your experience. You know, whilst on Hajj, you may have met other people from obviously the faith and so you'll be able to share what they might have taught you what you might have learned from them you may be more focused on being a good muslim on following the faith in the life that you then lead when you're back home you'll feel more purpose in your life potentially a greater sense of peace in life because your sins have been forgiven because you've actually been to the Kaaba in person you've seen it with your own eyes and you've you know retraced the earliest steps of the religion um, you'll be strengthened as a Muslim and you may also feel committed to helping the poor. Um, in terms of what acts then, what practices when you're there will lead to this? Obviously, that sense of equality is going to come from the fact that you are there with the three million pilgrims who are also traveling there every year. Your strengthening of faith will be the result of praying and also of circling the Kaaba. Um, the forgiveness of sins will be the result of visiting Arafat, which is known as the Mount of Mercy. So it's all about emphasizing God's mercy and receiving forgiveness of your sins when you go to Arafat. Um, you may then have that new focus on your religion as a result of going to the Zamzam well, because you will then have a greater sense of a dependence on God for your spiritual life. Uh, you will be a source of spiritual advice because it is the fifth and final pillar. And so it's a once in a lifetime thing. So once you've gone on Hajj, you have fulfilled the fifth and final pillar. And so you'll be seen as a source of spiritual advice because you have completed the five pillars. You know, many people may not have gone on Hajj yet. So you are the one who has completed all of the five pillars. You've done that important thing. One of the five duties as a Muslim and so you will be able to return to your community, you know, and share your experience, you know, with younger Muslims, for example. Um, you may feel more purpose and peace in your life because, of course, the experience teaches you patience. And it also gives you time and space to reflect on your faith and to develop your relationship with God whilst you are in the most sacred place on earth. Um, and also you will be committed to helping the poor because you have marked the Feast of Sacrifice whilst you're there with Eid al-Adha. So really important. And we will talk about festivals a little bit more later on. In terms then of these specific events that take place, the things that you do, the rituals that you perform on Hajj, 
I want to break some of them down for you. So we're going to start with your journey to and your arrival on Hajj. Um, and this is where you will put on Iram, which is uh, the white seamless robes, but it's also the spiritual state to prepare yourself in the same way that when you are praying, you perform wudu to have that physical and spiritual cleansing. Before you go on Hajj, you need to be wearing the white seamless robes and you need to have entered the state of Iram. Now, what is the purpose, significance, and importance of this well it shows unity and equality because you're all dressed identically and it strengthens your feeling of commitment and of course our, our, a sense excuse me of community within the ummah the great mosque then is our next location this is where you perform tawaf which is where you circle the kaaba seven times in an anti-clockwise direction this demonstrates the unity of all Muslims together in submission to God because you're all doing the same thing at the same time. It also shows your love for God because you are circulating the house of God. Uh, we then have Al Safa and Al Marwa Hills. So Sai, which means running between the hills of Safa and Marwa, and then you will drink and take water from the Zamzam well. This is where you are remembering Haja, Abraham's wife, when she was searching for water for Ishmael. Now the wellspring was seen as a miracle from God that it miraculously appeared that he then provided the water and obviously we need water in order to survive and so it emphasizes our dependence on God, that we depend on God in terms of our survival and in terms of our faith as well. So it shows dependence on God for our lives, the fact that our lives are part of his plan, that it is God who will give life but also that God will cause death. Um, and so that, again, emphasizes your submission to God, your submission to his will. Uh, we then have Mount Arafat, which is the Mount of Mercy. This is the stand where Muslims praise God. They read from the Quran and they ask for forgiveness as well. This is where Adam and Hawa were um, reunited. So Adam and Eve were reunited and where Muhammad also gave his final sermon. And so this is where Muslims hope to be forgiven. And then we have Mina, which is where Muslims collect and throw stones at three pillars. And this is called Jamara. It's also part of Eid al Adha when an animal is sacrificed, men's heads are shaved, and women cut off a lock of their hair. Now, this is where you are rejecting the devil. So you take the stones and you throw the stones at the pillars. And that is seen as a physical rejection of the devil and of evil. So again, linking to jihad, the struggle to overcome evil. This is you very physically, very visibly um, rejecting evil because you are stoning the devil. Um, it's also where you celebrate Eid al Adha, so we'll link it to practices as well, to festivals when we talk about the Feast of Sacrifice, where Ibrahim was prepared to sacrifice his son for God, a reminder of the importance of faith, of submission to God, and the fact that that will be rewarded by God. Remember, Ibrahim as an exemplar of faith. We then have the hair being cut as a symbol of purity. Uh, we then have Medina, which is where you pray at the Prophet's Mosque. And this is, of course, the place of the first mosque. Um, and it is where the first Muslim community was set up by Muhammad um, after he was forced to flee Mecca. Um, and all prayers here, it's believed, will be heard and accepted by God. So, you know, really important historically, going to the very first mosque. You know, you may visit, obviously, your local mosque. Um, when you're at home, but when you are attending the very first mosque, you know, you are at the place where that first Islamic community was created by Muhammad, you know, that has extra spiritual significance, doesn't it? Um, and then we also then have a return to the great mosque at the end of pilgrimage to perform tawaf again, to circle the Kaaba seven times in that anti-clockwise direction. Um, and this is your chance, of course, to see the holiest shrine for one last time again. You have been praying in this direction ever since you can remember. This is your chance to actually be there for yourself, to see it with your own eyes, to share the experience with the pilgrims, with the community, the ummah, um, and to strengthen your faith and develop your relationship with God. Now, we've spoken a lot about the Kaaba. I do want to just show you this image here. It is known as the House of God. It's the holiest site in Islam, as we've said, you know, when we're talking about why Mecca is so important, why Hajj is important. In total, it's thought to be 5,000 years old. Obviously, Islam is 1,400 years old. So it shows, you know, the history of Islam within that wider monotheistic tradition. It is the first mosque dedicated to the worship of one God, remember, as a monotheistic religion, Islam is focused on that idea. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. 
It was believed to have been rebuilt many times, for example, by Ibrahim and his son Ishmael. It's situated at the center of Islam's most important mosque in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, and it is central to the Hajj pilgrimage. It really is at the heart of the Hajj pilgrimage. Now, in terms of why Hajj is important, obviously we've just been through why certain things that you do, for example, at the Mount of Mercy um, are so important. But just sort of in general, why is Hajj pilgrimage important as the fifth and final pillar? Um, well, the Quran says it's obligatory for all Muslims who are physically able and can afford it. So that's from Surah 3. Hajj is seen as a powerful demonstration of the unity of the Ummah. Remember, three million people coming together to perform these practices, to be united in worshipping God, um, with Muslims, of course, from different denominations and countries converging in one place for the purpose of worship to fulfill this key requirement of their faith. Remember, it is a requirement of their faith. It's one of the five pillars of Islam. It means Muslims can actually see the Kaaba, the house of God for themselves, which will strengthen their faith and their relationship with God. And obviously that will then have long lasting effects, you know, well beyond the five days that they're actually on Hajj. And it's an opportunity for sins to be forgiven, for you to have a new start and to be reminded of your dependence on God and the need to submit to him, you know, and also, of course, to remind you of the importance of the Quran being revealed to Muhammad, of Muhammad founding the first Islamic community as well. So very, very, very important for Muslims. OK, let's talk about jihad, shall we? We're nearly there. And jihad means to struggle. Struggle, excuse me, I can't speak. Jihad means to struggle. Um, and it is rooted in the Quran, as all of these key practices are, of course. Now, it describes both the personal struggle of Muslims, the inner struggle, but then also the outer struggle, which, as I say, is a key link to theme D when we do talk about holy war. Um, now, there are two contrasting, different understandings of jihad, greater and lesser. So this is obviously really important in terms of understanding the contrasting ways jihad is understood. Because on the one hand, we have the greater jihad, which is the inner struggle, and then on the other hand, we have the lesser jihad, which is the military or the outer struggle to defend the religion. So on the one hand, greater jihad, excuse me, is about self-discipline, whereas lesser jihad is all about defending the religion. So let's start with greater jihad, shall we, with this inner struggle for self-discipline, which, as we know, is so important for Muslims, linking that to psalm, for example, and why fasting is important. So the duty of every Muslim is to live a good life, be faithful to God, and obey the commands of Islam. And this is what we mean by the greater jihad. Nobody said it was going to be easy. It's not going to be a walk in the park. It is going to be difficult. It's going to be demanding. And that is why God is then going to reward you for it after death. So this is done by, of course, following the five pillars, working for social justice, studying the Quran, doing good deeds, attending mosque regularly and resisting temptation, greed and envy. We then have the lesser jihad, which is the military struggle, um, or as I say, the defense of the religion in the external world. And this, of course, is very significant because Muhammad himself fought in holy wars in the earliest days of the religion. Um, now, it's carried out according to those strict rules for the purpose of defending Islam. And this reflects, as I say, what we know from theme D about just war theory, about holy wars. So it should be fought for a just cause. It should be fought as a last resort. It must be authorised by an accepted Muslim authority. A minimum amount of suffering should be caused. It should end when the enemy surrenders. Innocent civilians must not be attacked. And the aim should be to restore peace and freedom. Now, of course, we have key quotes from the Quran to underpin belief in jihad. So there are two that so fight in God's cause, those who fight you, but do not overstep the limits or do not transgress. Surah 22 says those who have been attacked are permitted to take up arms because they have been wronged. God has the power to help them. So, again, this idea of it being fought as a last resort and in defense of the religion. It is not you deciding, oh, we're going to go and attack them. This is all about defending the religion. Um, and so God will then support you in doing that. And that's why it would be seen as a holy war, because it's supported by God. It's with God's blessing. It is, you know, something God wishes to happen. Um, and then Surah 2 says, if they do fight you, so this is talking about um, the polytheists, so this quote says kill the polytheists if they do fight you kill them this is what such disbelievers deserve but if they stop then god is forgiving and merciful 
fight them until there is no more persecution and worship is devoted to God. So reflecting the fact that it should end when the enemy surrenders and that the aim must, of course, be to restore peace and freedom. Really important, of course, to consider this in the context of Islam's formation of the history of this religion you know Muhammad and the earliest Muslims were subjected to a great deal of um attack and a great deal of persecution and so that would say that would show us why lesser jihad was so important in the earliest days of Islam however we need to start thinking in terms of our AO2 is it still an absolute priority in the world today where we do have, for example, freedom of religion as something that is protected um, in the world? Now, I'm not saying, of course, that people aren't persecuted today because of their religion. Of course they are. But we have to think, for example, for a Muslim in modern Britain, which one might now be most important for them? You could, of course, say they are as equally important as one another. But you could also say that in you know the modern world, fortunately, because religious freedoms are guaranteed, at least you know in in this in this country in the UK, you can now focus more on that greater jihad, on that inner struggle. Now I've put some points down here for us to consider. Both are found in the Quran, which is considered by Muslims to contain the infallible, complete word of God. So you can say that both are absolutely important because both are found in the Quran. You know, it says you must have that self-discipline, but that you must also defend the religion. You know, for example, we see there, Surah 2, fighting God's cause, those who fight you. You know, we know from our study of theme D how important it is to be prepared to fight if necessary for a just cause. Most Muslims, however, agree that greater jihad is the most important as it is stressed in the Quran. So you could say that has to come first. You have to be a good Muslim first, and that will then give you the strength and the ability to then take part in lesser jihad if you need to. You know, you need to practice the religion well yourself before you can then defend it from external threats, for example. So you need to develop good Muslim qualities and live a good Muslim life yourself. And then you will be enabled to fight if you need to for uh, the religion and to protect the religion from external threat, if that makes sense. Greater Jihad is a personal battle. Of course, it's about self-discipline, which is understood by many to be the true meaning of the term. So that is seen as the original meaning of the term, that it is about self-discipline as opposed to external defence. It's about preparing yourself for Judgment Day and taking responsibility for your own conduct, your own actions and the way in which you live your own life. Even though, of course, Muhammad was involved in military battles, as we know, he himself fought in holy wars. He actually supported greater jihad as more important. However, there may be occasions when Islam is threatened um, and it may be appropriate or seen as necessary to defend Islam. Um, and Islam, of course, does have set conditions for this. We know that from our study of just war theory and holy war, which shows it can happen. So, yeah, just be thinking in terms of your AO2. Is the greater jihad or the lesser jihad more important or are they equally as important as one another? As long as you have got quotes and examples. And remember, when you're talking about the greater jihad, you can refer to Psalm, for example, can't you? And how that develops self-discipline as long as you've got evidence and examples whatever you're arguing will be credit worthy yeah but just make sure that you are linking it back to scripture you are linking it to other practices to other pillars as well in order to strengthen your argument okay let's move on to our final final topic we've made it congratulations guys and it is of course festivals. Now I've put a note there on the screen to link back to beliefs and teachings when revising their importance because of course a festival is a celebration of something that has happened in the past isn't it and so everything we spoke about on beliefs and teachings underpins these festivals. It gives us the reasons we are actually celebrating them today that modern Muslims would be celebrating these festivals in the world today. We, we see that because of what's happened for example stories in the Quran. So an example of this is Sirah 2, which says it was in the month of Ramadan that the Quran was revealed as guidance for mankind. So any one of you who is present that month should fast. So again, that is showing you how the festival is rooted in what we read in scripture, because it was in the month of Ramadan that the Quran was revealed. And so in today's world, modern Muslims should be fasting during that month. So it's just showing you there that key link between beliefs and teachings and practices. 
And then Spirit 2 also says, oh, you who have believed, decreed upon you is fasting as it was decreed upon those before you that you may become righteous. So again, demonstrating to us, you know, the importance of these practices, how they are rooted in history, how they are grounded in the key beliefs and teachings, you know, these rituals of the religion, which have been practiced for hundreds of years. So the first and a very important one, the first festival we need to know about is Id al Adha, the end of Hajj. And of course, we've just spoken about Hajj um, and it's important for Muslims, haven't we? And then the festival of sacrifice is particularly important. Because this is about remembering Ibrahim's willingness to sacrifice his son when God asked him to. And remember, we've said that Ibrahim is an exemplar of faith. Um, so we spoke about him when we spoke about prophets for beliefs and teachings. Do check that video. And we said he is an exemplar of faith. He shows Muslims what it means to be committed to your faith, to submit to the will of God. And as we said with Salah, it is so important for Muslims to be submitting to God. They do it physically during the rakas, and they should be doing it every single day in their deeds, their actions and how they live their lives. So this story is found in Surah 37 of the Quran, and it reminds Muslims of the test of faith faced by Ibrahim and how they should apply this to their own lives, as well as the mercy that was then shown by God. And it also signifies the end of Hajj. And so this is a celebration. It's a celebration of his willingness to sacrifice his son because it's what God commanded, because he believed that was the will of God and he was submitting to the will of God. He was demonstrating the faith he has in God that even though he might not understand God's plan or the reasons God might do something, he still has faith in him, showing his submission, which is at the core of being a good Muslim and living a good Islamic life, isn't it? The Muslims remember their own willingness to sacrifice anything to God's wishes. They celebrate this festival with the sacrifice of an animal. And remember, God did send Ibrahim an animal to sacrifice instead of his son, um, which is shared among family, friends and the poor. And prayers, cards and presents will be given. So it's all about celebrating Ibrahim as an exemplar of faith and his willingness to sacrifice his son for God. Um, and that is an important message for Muslims in terms of their submission to God's will as well, and their commitment to faith in him. So it's a festival of sacrifice, but it's also a focus on faith, on submitting to the will of God and putting your faith in him and celebrating how Ibrahim um, won, if you like, that test of faith that he demonstrated his faith to God. And that is reminding Muslims, that is teaching Muslims the importance of having faith in God, of submitting to God um, and being faithful to him, no matter what happens in life or what is asked of you, however demanding, you know, being a good Muslim may be. We then have Id al-Fitr, which is the end of Ramadan, okay? And this is the time to celebrate and thank Allah for his help in getting through the month of fasting. You know, it's been a difficult month. It's been a demanding month, but God has helped to sustain you. Your faith has got you through it. And this is where you are then thanking God for that. And so it's all about expressing gratitude to him. It's an opportunity to wear new clothes, exchange gifts. And it's also then where Zakat becomes due. And this is very significant because, of course, we said that going through Storm, going through fasting during Ramadan makes you not only God conscious, but also conscious of the suffering other people in the world may be going through. And so the fact that then Zakat becomes due is significant because you've just been reminded during Ramadan of why Zakat is so important, because you've developed that sympathy and concern for others who, you know, are not able to eat or drink throughout the entire year. And then Zakat becomes due. So it becomes particularly significant, doesn't it, that you are paying it because you realise why you're paying it. So it has that added meaning and that added significance. And so obviously you're celebrating the end of Ramadan. It is a big celebration that, you know, you have made it through the month of fasting um, and that God has helped you to do that. So you're thanking God, you're appreciating God um, and yeah, you're celebrating your faith as a community, very important, you're coming together as a community. So Muslims celebrate with their family and community, homes are decorated, there will be special services and a celebratory meal is shared and Muslims will wish one another Eid Mubarak. And then finally, Ashura, this is the 10th day of Muharram, the first month of the Islamic calendar. 
This is a day of fasting and mourning. It remembers how Noah left the ark and how Moses and the Israelites were saved from the Egyptians. Muhammad had observed the Jews fasting because, of course, remember, uh, Noah and Moses are key characters, key figures in the Old Testament of the Bible, in the Jewish Torah. And so remember, with the monotheistic religions, the Abrahamic faiths, we see these connections. And so Muhammad had observed the Jews fasting um, and they were obviously doing that to remember Moses saving the Israelites and therefore adopted this practice. So he was actually inspired by observing the Jews fasting, reflecting the fact that um, Islam, Christianity and Judaism are the Abrahamic faiths, that they share belief in one God, in the oneness of God. Now, importantly, Shia Muslims also mourn the martyrdom of um, Hussein at Kabbalah in 680 CE. He was the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. So again, reflecting the imamah and the idea of descendancy from the Prophet, the family of the Prophet. Um, and so they will wear black and no music is allowed. So that's a really key point to note that Shia Muslims also see this as a very somber occasion because it's about mourning the martyrdom of Hussein at Kabbalah because he was the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. And remember, uh, in accordance with the belief in the Imamate, Shia Muslims pay particularly close attention to the family of the Prophet, to those who are descendants of him. And so they would wear black and no music is allowed. And so whilst all Muslims would be observing the fasting because of uh, Moses saving the Israelites because of this key um, event that Muhammad was inspired by seeing Jews celebrate. We then also have this mourning that is also marked by Shia Muslims, reflecting that particular interest in the descendancy in the family of the prophet. So why are festivals important? Why are festivals such as at the end of Hajj, end of Ramadan um, and Ashura, why are they important? Why do we need them? Well, they give a sense of identity and belonging to the religion and, of course, to followers of the religion. They allow Muslims to remember past events and important people within the religion. So they provide an opportunity for reflection and education, as well, of course, an opportunity for inspiration. For example, Ibrahim's test of faith the strength of his faith and his submission to the will of God. They unite Muslims in terms of bringing communities together, so the Ummah coming together, for example, to celebrate the end of Ramadan, um, and also families, you know, families come together to educate the children, to celebrate as a family. And um, they connect Muslims with the worldwide community, of course, it's something that is marked by the world's two billion Muslims. It allows Muslims to share their beliefs as a family, as a community, but also wider. You know, if you, for example, are celebrating, you might talk about that with your neighbours or with people at school or in your workplace. So it's an opportunity to share and celebrate your faith. It allows you to mark key events in the Islamic calendar through the year. And so it creates tradition for families and communities, you know, to, to celebrate those events together. And then as you get older, your children can have children and do the same. So it creates tradition, which is very important for religions. It is, of course, about expressing gratitude. It's about growing closer to God, which, of course, for Muslims is very important, isn't it? And it strengthens uh, Muslims' faith. So it allows them to, you know, develop and strengthen their beliefs and their commitment to their religion. And that is it from me. Thank you for watching. I hope this has been helpful. Goodbye.